Does that look correct to everybody? That looks good. Okay, here we go. Um, so I first wanna start off by saying thank you to uh, Renee and Chelsea and Doug for putting this together and also for organizing this little virtual Zoom session of the SHA. Um, let's see. It is not wanting to advance. Okay. No. Okay. Got it. <laughs> okay, so very few of the thousands of Chinese women who immigrated to North America in the late 19th century left behind written records, were documented by contemporary sources, or have made it into history books. Polly Bemis is an exception. Having been nominated to Idaho's Hall of Fame and appearing in fourth grade curriculum across the state, <clears throat> popularity has not always meant accuracy, however, in the telling of her story. Polly has been called a prostitute, she was not, has been said to have been won in a poker game, she was not, and has been given the questionable name of Lalu Nathoy in, in works that include a 1981 biographical novel, a 1990 movie, and multiple scholarly publications. Archaeological studies centering Chinese um, American women are also extremely rare. Surveying the literature in 1993, Asian American Comparative Collection, also known as the ACC, AACC curator, Priscilla Wagers, found that although artifacts related to Chinese women appear sporadically in the archeological assemblages, few can be connected to specific individuals and even fewer yet are part of the adequately sized data sets to examine daily life. Since then, several archeologically informed analysis of historical documents related to Chinese immigrants living in the Market Street Chinatown in San Jose, California, and among the mining communities connected to the Comstock load in Nevada, have examined women's lives in more detail, but tend to focus on groups of women living relative, in relatively populous areas. In this way, Polly Bemis is again an exemption. An exemption, exception. Um, not only did she have the majority of her adult life living along the banks of the very rural Salmon River, also known as the River of No Return, but in 2021, Polly Bemis became the primary focus of the archaeological project that this that is the subject of this talk. The Polly Bemis Ranch Archaeological Project is part of a larger um, research endeavor by the AACC at the University of Idaho to uncover the history of this exceptional woman and to disentangle the truth of Polly Bemis from the stories that are so often told about her. A major outcome of this research is the full-length biography, Polly Bemis, The Life and Times of a Chinese American Pioneer, written by Priscilla Wagers and published in 2020. Meticulously researched and footnoted, this book laid the foundation for the subsequent archeological project in more ways than one, and reconstructs what we do and don't know about Polly Bemis's life from an array of historical sources that include government records, contemporary diaries, and newspaper articles, some of which are even Polly's own words. Polly Bemis, was probably born in Northern China on or around September 11, 1853, to a poor family from an ethnic minority group. No documentation of her birth or her birth name has yet been discovered and likely doesn't exist. And there were no indications that Polly had ever used the Lalu Nathoy birth name so often cited in literary works. Interviews with Polly from the 1920s and 1930s provides some indication of how she ended up in Idaho, though details occasionally vary in different accounts. According to the version most frequently recounted by Polly, around the time she was 15 years old, she was sold by her family and sent to the United States by way of Hong Kong. An old woman smuggled her into Portland where she was sold for $2,500. She was then taken to the gold rush town of Warren's, now Warren, Idaho, by pack train and arrived in 1872 at just 19 years old. As she dismounted her horse, a bystander reported, um, report, reported exclaimed, here's Polly, giving her the name that she would use for the rest of her life. 
Between 1872 and sometime before 1880, Polly lived with a Chinese man who had purchased her. Though his name remains a mystery, Polly's purchase price suggests he was a wealthy man, and later interviews with Polly indicate that there may have been a that he may have been the owner of a business or entertainment establishment where Polly interacted with the public. Communication must have been hard for Polly, who likely spoke Mandarin or, or a Northern minority dialect, and who would have been surrounded by Cantonese speaking migrants from Southern China and predominantly English speaking Euro-Americans. The most common narrative about Polly's life during this time was that she was a prostitute but historical documents in her own accounts contradict this. More likely, she was a concubine or a second wife to her wealthy owner. Many supposed, supposedly historical document and narratives also claim that Polly's relationship with Charlie Bemis began when he won her in a poker game, presumably from her from, former owner. In her later life, however, Polly publicly denied this. A less dramatic but more likely scenario is offered in an interview with um, Herb McDowell, a Warren resident who knew Polly Bemis when he was a boy. Herb stated that Polly and Charlie got close when she helped Lee Dick, the local Chinese physician, treat Charlie for a gunshot wound, and that when he got better, they got married just like any other normal people. Polly never explained how she became single but it is recorded as a widow on the 1880 census, suggesting that her former owner husband had died. This census also places Polly in the same household as Charlie Bemis, an indication that the two had become involved, though they were not yet legally married. For the next 15 years, Polly and Charlie lived together in Warren. He ran a saloon and invested in various mining claims, while Polly ran a small boarding house and washed and mended clothes on the side. In, the August, in August of 1894, Polly and Charlie Bemis were married in Warrens. Not long after, they moved to a remote mining claim along the Salmon River, where they would live for, the most, for most of their remaining lives. Their decision to marry after so many years together was undoubtedly influenced by changing legal context surrounding Chinese immigrants. Between 1864 and 1887, Idaho's Miscegenation laws made it a misdemeanor for Caucasians to marry African-American, Native American, or Chinese individuals. Chinese and Native Americans dropped from the legislation after 1887, however, making the Bemis's union legal. At the same time, other legislation made Polly's residency in Idaho tenacious. The 1892 um, Gary Act which extended the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, passed just two years before the Bemis' wedding. It stipulated that every Chinese resident living in the United States had to obtain and carry a, cer a certification of residency or risk de deportation. In her biography of Polly, Wager speculates that given the timing of these events, the couple might have thought marriage and their subsequent move to the remote Salmon River would give Polly more protection from possible harassment or threat of deportation. Beginning in 1902 and continuing until her death in, 18, in, 1980, in 1933, Polly's life on the Salmon River is captured in the diaries written by Charlie Shep, a miner from Ohio who settled directly across the river from the Bemises. Short daily entries document activities on both sides of the river, providing a remarkably detailed account of rural life for Shep and the Bemises. Together, Polly and Charlie tended a large garden, growing crops like apples, asparagus, cabbage, corn, parsnips, peaches, squash, strawberries, tobacco, tomatoes, and watermelon. Polly and Charlie also raised chickens and tended domestic livestock like cats, dogs, horses, and a cow and a milk cow. Charlie hunted local bear, deer, and grouse, and Polly is known to have excelled at catching fish. Though clearly self-sufficient and even isolated at times, diary entries indicate that life on the river was punctuated by visits from travelers using the river or trails to pass through the area. These people often stopped by to visit with Polly and Charlie, 
or to buy extra produce and eggs from their large farm. Shep's daily notes also make clear the mutually supportive relationship between the two ranches, which often shared food, pooled shopping orders from catalogs or trips to town and helped one another with tasks. As Charlie Bemis's health began to fail, Shep and his mining partner, Peter Klinkerhammer, Klinkhammer, provided increasingly as uh, in, provided increasing assistance to Polly. In August of 1922, the Bemis's cabin caught on fire. Shep crossed the river to help Polly save the now bedbound Charlie from the flames, though Polly's dog and nearly all of, all of her possessions were consumed. Two months later, Charlie died and Polly went to live in Grangeville while her neighbors from the Shep ranch built a small cabin for her on the Bemis's property. The cabin is where Polly lived from 1924 until her death in 1933. During this time, she continued to tend her, her large garden, fish from the river, and visit with her river neighbors. After her death, Polly's cabin remained on the property. In 1987, it was restored by the ranch's new owner and listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Currently, it serves as a small museum for rafters floating the Salmon River. And and houses a few of Polly's items that have been found on the property over the year. It is in front of and around this cabin that our project took place. The Polly Bemis Ranch Archaeological Project was conducted from the 25th through the 30th of April 2021. There were several unique situations that we encountered when putting this project together. The first was gaining permission to conduct an archaeological study at the Polly Bemis Ranch, which is a privately owned property that has a collection of co-owners who are all involved in the operation of the ranch. As such, we had to propose the Polly Bemis, to the Polly Bemis Ranch Board um, at many of their annual meetings, um, the archaeological project that we wanted to conduct. Luckily, one of the board members was married to an artist who was in the process of creating a statue of Polly Bemis for the ranch to be installed on Polly Bemis Day in Idaho August, this past August 10th. The board became interested in doing mitigation for the footprint of the statue by her cabin at the ranch and our proposal for archeological investigations was accepted with stipulations. We could not leave long-term traces of the excavation and couldn't damage any property on the ranch. The board invited us to stay at the ranch that spring and conduct our in investigations. Renee and I were able to gather four graduate students and one undergrad from, the, Uni um, from uh, the University of Idaho who wanted to volunteer their time for this project. We also um, had an expert metal detectorist, Dan Lute, who previously volunteered on U of I projects in Boise, and of course, our resident expert, Dr. Priscilla Wagers. Once our team was assembled, we had to figure out how to run an archaeological project in the time of COVID. This included everyone having to be fully vaccinated, acquiring permissions from the University of Idaho and the Polly Bemis Ranch, all of the project participants self-isolating the week leading up to the project, and having a COVID protocol in place for our travels and the time at the ranch. Luckily, everything worked out and we were given the green light for the project. As mentioned earlier in this paper, the Polly Bemis Ranch is located up the Salmon River, also known as the River of No Return. Accessing the site required us to take a quote unquote rustic um, and scenic two hour car ride from Riggins to the boat launch area. There we loaded up our archeological equipment, personal gear and ourselves on a jet boat. Our misty and windswept journey on the river took another choppy 45 minutes to reach the ranch. It was during this journey that we began to feel just how remote and vast the landscape was. Our modern modes of transportation meant our journey took only a fraction of the time it would have taken those visitors to the Polly Bemis property. Upon landing at the beach, our equipment and gear were schlepped up a fairly kind of sleep stope, sleep, sleep, steep, steep slope um, past Polly's second cabin to our accommodations. Once at the ranch, we had four full days to conduct our archeological work. One focus was Polly's cabin and the potential areas for the statue. We placed three one-by-one one units in these areas. 
um, a second focus was gathering as much preliminary information as possible, including metal detecting and interviewing. Um, Dan Lute performed metal detecting around the grounds of the cabin, working with the live-in caretaker of the Polybemus Ranch. We placed seven STUs in areas that seemed like lo likely locations for buildings and potential um, places for her first cabin. Priscilla also interviewed the caretaker, Mike, who had grown up on the Shep Ranch across the river and had worked for the, for the Polybemus Ranch um, almost his whole life. We were interested in and thoughts that he had of what he had heard growing up and while working at the ranch. Um, we also made these little kind of time lapse stop videos um, just to kind of see if this would work. And, and you can see that this is uh, the students and volunteers that we had <laughs> were very careful about taking up the sod and the grass because we wanted to leave no trace behind and put everything back together. There. There's just another little clip really quickly. So we're continuing right now um, to process the polybemus artifacts, um, but I just wanted to highlight in the next couple slides a couple of the cool things that we found. Um, so it's kind of a sneak peek. Um, so here is a selection of items that we recovered from the units placed outside of the front of her cabin. Um, we found two tobacco tin tags. Um, these were used on plugs of tobacco to ensure kind of the authenticity or the brand um, that you were purchasing. As you can see from this ad, um, it says star, good for one, better for two. Men who chew or men who do. I thought that this was uh, very interesting since it was most likely Polly who, who partook in tobacco. Historic photos and written accounts um, show her holding a pipe and smoking. Um, other artifacts, uh, another artifact is a harmonica reed, which um, really kind of spoke to us when we were out there at the Polybemus Ranch, as it was easy to imagine the sounds of the harmonica carrying down to the river across to the Shep Ranch. As um, while we were working out there, it was easy to see that sounds traveled along the river and, um, and it was kind of a, in contrast with the quiet solitude that blankets the setting most of the time. During the project, we could always hear when there was a jet boat coming or there were people that were coming to visit. Another artifact that we found was a leather boot upper. Uh, we know from a photo, photo that Polly of Polly that she used to wear uh, these boots. We unearthed several um, domestic items, including stoneware crock fragments and whiteware fragments. Um, we also recovered glass fragments from mason canning jars. Um, all of these make sense as she was processing food from her garden, cooking meals in her cabin. Um, we also found items related to um, horses and as well as blacksmithing. While our work has only just begun on the life of Polly Bemis at her ranch and on the river of no return, we can say that the myths surrounding her are not as interesting as her real life. We hope to continue the collaboration with the AACC and the Polly Bemis Ranch to further our work. Um, if you're interested in this project, uh, keep your eyes peeled. We had a donation, um, and so we have funding for students who are going to work on processing the collection this semester. Um, also, Renee and I would like to like wrap this up by thanking the Polly Bemis Ranch owners um, and employees, the AACC, our hardworking and talented crew, but most importantly, um, Priscilla Wagers. <laughs>